Well, good morning again. It's good to see you all here. And we truly do have a privilege to jump into God's Word. Something that I have to remind myself of sometimes, um, if, well, I'll speak for myself. Um, I'm a very routine-oriented person, and I can get caught into the checklist mentality, right? Just doing things because it's the right thing to do. And habits aren't bad, so I'm not saying in that, that respect, but sometimes it can lose the meaning and the true sense and the oomph behind it all. And sometimes, even for me, when I'm reading Scripture, um, it can be more habitual as opposed to me reading it to hear from God and to really appreciate what it says, all right? Um, and so, I really mean it. When I say, you know, we have the privilege of looking into God's Word, it is a privilege. It's a privilege, and it's one that many people around the world just don't have for one reason or another. Um, and so, I hope you can appreciate that um, this morning. But let's pray and we're going to continue to dive into this sermon, this awesome sermon that Jesus Christ gave over 2,000 years ago. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity, God, to uh, be in this safe place, to consider your word, to consider who you are, to consider who we are and what it is you are calling us to do. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, its clarity, God. And I pray that it will be clear to us today. Uh, and it will be the thing that uh, moves us uh, in whatever area you want it to, to align more and more with you. So bless our time today, God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're continuing to go through uh, this sermon. Uh, this is a sermon that Jesus gave uh, quite a while back. And so as we continue to walk through um, Jesus, we're going to really appreciate how Pretty much from here all the way through, Jesus is pointing back specifically to the heart issue. Um, so we're talking not so much about outward performance. You hear a lot about that today. It's what you do. Well, what you do does matter. But what Jesus taught is that what you do emanates or comes from what's in your heart. Uh, that's just the way that it is. And so the scribes and the Pharisees, they wanted to leave all of the spiritual conversations on the external peripheral level right? Don't, don't talk about my heart. Just look at what I'm doing. Or don't you see how much I tithe? Or don't you see how much I do this? Or don't you? And Jesus is not so much ignoring that, but he's saying, well, that's all good and all, but it's the heart that matters. It's the heart that matters. And that is Jesus' focus as he goes through um, pretty much the rest of this sermon. Now, one thing that's interesting, I think, um, again, we talked about this last week where Jesus is talking about the fact that the law that was already revealed and established is the only law that still holds and on which he continued to build his theology, if you will, or expound or to teach what the Old Testament already said. Now, sometimes we can consider the Old Testament as outdated, like it was all of this um, ritual and rule and all the rest of it, and it had no heart in it. But that's not true. The Old Testament was always all about the heart. So what Jesus continues to teach here is what the Old Testament already taught and what the scribes and Pharisees should have understood, but they didn't. They were always doing the performance stuff, and Jesus was saying, no, it's about the heart. It's in your law. It's in the Old Testament. So even for us, we might have an idea that, you know, the Old Testament is just like over here, and we live under grace, and all the heart stuff and the internal cool stuff, spiritual stuff is in the New Testament, but not in the Old. It's not true. The whole Old Testament was about the heart, and that's what Jesus is trying to teach them. He's not trying to help them understand what Paul's going to write some hundreds of years later. He says, no, you have the law. It's all in there. It's always been about the heart, always been about the heart. So Jesus devoted a lot of this sermon to exposing the faulty principles and motivations of the legalistic system that had replaced God's own revealed word. The problem wasn't that they didn't have the word. They did. The problem was that they didn't deal with the word as it was intended in terms of a heart. They were always looking at the outside external stuff. So let's go ahead. We're going to read these few verses as we consider the truth about anger, something that I think we can all um, agree that at least at some time in our lives we've experienced, struggled with, or et cetera, or maybe that's somewhere we are at right now. But let's read these few verses uh, together. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. That's what Jesus says. He says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus continues to zoom in on the heart because at the end of the day, right external things, they're only acceptable to God if the heart matches. We can get locked into this ideology and it's flipping and, 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 and it's all through the world as we know. It's like, it's what you do. Don't worry about what your heart's like. It's what you do. But Jesus says, nope. What you do is only really acceptable to God if your heart is right. And from that heart, the things that you do have come out. And that takes us to our bottom line today, which is this, from 1 Samuel 16 and 7, familiar verse, simply this. People look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. People look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Jesus starts off this section with the phrase, you have heard it said. And he says that a few times, and you'll see it even in the next couple of weeks as we continue. And this refers to the rabbinical teaching, the traditions, the law, the, the oral um, information that have been passed on and the traditions. He's saying, you've heard this. I know you have. I've been living here. This is what you've heard. But Jesus is making a specific distinction between what the people have heard through the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees and what the Old Testament really taught and what Jesus now brings more clarity about. And the main point that Jesus exposes is that righteousness is a matter of the heart. Right? It's a matter of the heart. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's about having the right heart, which causes us to do the right thing. So that's the first thing that Jesus exposes as he really uh, narrows in on this uh, teaching that the scribes and Pharisees had. The second thing was this. The teaching of the rabbis, you know, they were at odds with God's word. So sometimes we can get to the idea or we can think that, you know what, this is my tradition, I hold to it. It's not bad, but yeah, but it's at odds with what God's word says. And that was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees. They had all of God's word, but the way that they taught it was at odds with what it actually said and what it actually meant. And just an encouragement for you and I, many of us have grown up in church, had different church experience, etc. And we might hold to the fact that, you know what, this is how my family does church. This is how I grew up doing church. This is right, that's wrong, all the rest of it. And, you know, it's not for me to say yay or nay per se. But the only thing that determines whether something's right or wrong is, does it agree with what God's word says? Doesn't matter what your traditions are. Doesn't matter what my traditions are. What matters is what God's word says. And this is the issue that the scribes and Pharisees had, and this is an issue that you and I can have sometimes. Okay, so here Jesus is contrasting his teaching, which was consistent with the Old Testament. Jesus didn't come to change anything with the Jewish written and oral traditions that had accumulated over hundreds of years and that watered down and perverted God's word. Now, it's, it's very important to understand the context of this, and it's really powerful. So I was going through this like with a, like a little boy in a candy store, like appreciating how Jesus is teaching, why he's teaching it, and all the rest of it. The context that Jesus is speaking into has to be understood based on where Judaism as a Jewish religion was at that time. And it was very similar to what took place in the 15th and 16th century in Europe as it pertained to the church and the Protestant Reformation. Now, maybe you know a little bit about that, maybe you don't, but I'm just going to give you a quick summary. Basically, what was happening and being developed during that time in Europe was this system under the Roman Catholic Church that taught a lot of stuff that wasn't in the Bible. But there was a problem. Latin was the language in which the scriptures were written. But nobody knew Latin. 
So if you were a commoner in Europe during that time, you might want to go and understand what God's, God's word meant, and you would literally just take whatever the priest was saying as truth, but you had nothing to compare it to. And furthermore, if a text was available, it would have been so expensive that only the elite persons have it, and the priest had it, and so as the priest taught it, you just said, oh, that's what the Bible says, I guess. But they didn't have anything to compare it to. One of the most important things about the Protestant Reformation, and you can read about this, it's really in, in, in interesting and the like, is that it put Scripture into the common person's language and made it available to people. That was one of the most important things about the whole Reformation. Prior to that, all people would do is sit around and just look and listen and say, yep, 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 but having nothing to compare it to. You might remember a time in the books of Acts where the Berean church is, is, is encouraged for being so diligent in studying God's word. This church, they would go to wherever the apostles were and they would sit and listen to the teaching. And before they let the thought of what was being taught leave their mind, they went home to see what the scripture actually said about what was taught. That was their habit. So in a real way, just like that situation in Europe during that time, Judaism had suffered in a very similar way. Now, if you understand biblical history a little bit, the Jews, they had been um, captured and Israel went up to the Syria and now uh, Judah and Babylon and all the rest of it. They had lost their ability to use functional Hebrew. Because when they went into Babylon, everything was stripped. They took the best and the brightest, and the whole point was to take away what they knew from them so that they could be like the Babylonians, lose all of their Jewish uh, heritage and the like, and become like them, and it was a mess. So now you have a group of people who have left Babylon. God has been faithful. They've come back home under Nehemiah and Ezra, and people don't know Hebrew. Furthermore, when they would go and learn and listen to persons teaching it, right, they didn't have it on iPads and stuff. They had to go into a service. But nobody knew what was being said. So you know what they would do? They would just nod and say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That must be right. You might remember this verse. This is a verse, Nehemiah 8.8, and it says this. They read from the book. This is the now back out of slavery. They're back home. They're trying to get things going again for the nation. And this is Ezra, the scribe, a faithful follower of God, teaching and preaching. And he says, they read from the book, from the law of God, the Old Testament, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. You know why they had to do that? They had to literally interpret it because the people didn't have a clue. If you had just spoken to them from the Hebrew text, all they would have done is say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they didn't understand anything. Had no idea. So this is a habit that was already in place during that time. And now you move forward hundreds of years to Jesus being on the scene. And what would happen is there would be no teaching about the law. What would be taught would be the traditions that had been accumulated over hundreds of years by the scribes and Pharisees that did not match up to what the law taught. So that is the context in which Jesus is now teaching the Jews. These people, they, they, they have sincere hearts, maybe not all of them, right? But they're hearing Jesus say stuff, and they're like, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me, like, you, you know what I've heard, but now you come to set the record straight. The reason is the only thing that they heard was what the scribes and Pharisees taught them. They didn't have functional understanding of their own national language. So this is the context in which Jesus is teaching. And he says, here's another verse, right? Matthew 7, 28, which explains how they thought about Jesus' teaching. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus messed up everything that they knew about religion, about God, about the hard thing, about what was important, messed it all up. So they had to make a decision about who this Jesus was. And after Jesus has finished the sermon that we're going through right now, it was just like they're sitting back saying, man, 
I've never, like, I grew up as a little boy, a little girl. I've heard every scribe and Pharisee teaching and the Talmud and the Jewish rules and all of the, the oral traditions and all the rest of it. But, like, this guy, Jesus, he's not referring to any of this stuff. The only thing he's referring to is the Old Testament, God's revealed law. And when he teaches and he speaks, he teaches like he actually has authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. This is the context in which Jesus is teaching this. So today we're looking at the first of six illustrations of heart righteousness that Jesus gives. And he starts with murder and its root, which is anger. Okay? Now, what was the first homicide in the Bible or in creation or in the world as we knew it? What was that? Cain and Abel, all right? And I'm sure you probably heard that little joke. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because he was able. All right. Anyway, that was the first murder. (laughs) First murder, all right? And so what Jesus is referring to here is the willful, intentional murder. That's what he's referring to. Somebody who has absolute disregard for somebody else and says, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. I'm just going to take them out. That's the space in which we're talking about. And so the rules for this kind of act, for intentional murder, they're laid out in Genesis 9, 6. And this is what it says. It says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Again, talking about homicide, talking about intentional, I don't like this person, they irritate me, I'm just going to kill them, I have no regard for their life, doesn't matter. I am just going to take them out. And so we see what the punishment for that type of thinking and that type of act is, is capital punishment. That's what God says in his law. Again, we have to see the context of the type of person and the heart of that person as to how God determines uh, their punishment should be. Now, most of the hearers at this time, everyone in the congregation or in the mountain or wherever, listening to this sermon, they would have agreed that murder was horrible, shouldn't do it, right? They would have agreed that capital punishment, based on that kind of heart, is appropriate. After all, God said it in his word, but I can see the logic of that. Many of them would have thought like that. They also would have been convinced that, you know what, I'm so glad I'm not like people who have killed people, because that's not me. I don't have that issue. I don't have that intent. So everybody would have agreed that murder is wrong, but none of them would have thought that they could remotely be associated with that kind of heart, even though they didn't do that action. Many would have thought like that. But Jesus is now attacking, like you see this, he's going through this and he's literally shattering the ideas of self-confidence in terms of, well, I'm not like that person. I don't do what that person does. Yeah, okay, well, what's your heart like? Jesus just consistently walks through that space. He tears away at the self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And you remember in verse 20, we already looked at that, and it said that, you know, unless your righteousness, Jesus said, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Like, Jesus has already said that, the level at which the scribes and Pharisees teach and live, if you don't exceed that, you're not getting in. So this is consistent with what Jesus has been saying. So it says in verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Again, you shall not commit murder. That was from Exodus 20, 10 commandments. Everybody knew that. Nobody would have disagreed with that. But the traditional view that the Jews had and the penalty that they vetted out based on this is that they didn't take into consideration what God had already said in Genesis 9, 6. God had already laid the foundation for this kind of behavior. And it was, listen, if you have a murderous heart that has no regard for anybody else, the punishment for that should be death. That's what God said. So problem number one is that they were using a standard that was much lower than God's standard. Problem number two was that they didn't consider that God's holiness was at stake because people are made in his image. 
And problem number three was that none of the way that they addressed this horrible act dealt with the heart. They just left it on a very superficial level. To the extent that in order to really understand this, you have to understand what, um, so you have heard that it was said there's a world. He's talking about what the rules and the traditions that the Jews and the scribes and Pharisees had in place. You shall not murder, absolutely scriptural. But then they say, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. What that means is that you, if you committed a murder, you would be under the direction of the court, and whatever the court thought was appropriate is what you would get. The further problem with that is oftentimes it meant that if you had connections in the court, your punishment would be much less than it would be for somebody else, and surely much less than God already said it should be. So God has already established what the law is, but the rabbis and teachers had confined murder simply to a civil issue and had just left it in the course of humans as if they could represent God in this way. God had already established what he wanted them to do. So this is what you guys heard. He's talking to all of This is what you heard. I know this is what they're teaching you. But Jesus said, but this is what I have to tell you. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And again, Jesus is contrasting his teaching with the rabbinic traditions, not the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law, standard, it's not going to change. But all of these laws and the like, that was the issue. Jesus is wanting to really help the scribes and Pharisees, but all of the people understand that, you know what? You've got to use the right standard for understanding what it is the Old Testament is actually teaching. And the standard isn't the external, you know, I didn't do that or I didn't do that. He's saying, listen, it all originates in the heart. So in a real way, you could say, I have never murdered. I have never done that. And, but at the same time, you could have a, a murderous heart that is on par with somebody who has committed murder or even worse, without even doing the act. That's what Jesus is teaching. You could be a model law-abiding citizen, but still be more guilty than somebody else who is on death row. That's what it's teaching. Self-righteousness, we're not talking about. We're talking about heart righteousness. This is what 1 John 3, 15, 15 says. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, the default position of people is that, you know what, as bad as it looks on the outside, yeah, maybe I do that, maybe I do that, maybe I, but you know what, way on deep, I'm actually a nice person, you know. If you really got to know me, I know I do, you know, but I'm really a nice person. And Jesus flips it and says, well, no, it, what you see on the outside is only possible because of what's going on on the inside. And if we don't deal with what's going on on the inside, the outside is just a facade. Doesn't get you anywhere. So he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. The scribes and Pharisees, we just looked at it, they had their system, which was, look, if you murder somebody, then you go to court, we'll see what the court has to say. Jesus says, no, it's worse than that. If you're angry with that same type of murderous heart, a heart that says, you know what, man, I wish that person was dead. May never do it, but you know, I, I really wish that that person, they just drive me crazy, and I just wish that they weren't alive. Jesus says that type of angry anger, you should get the same punishment for somebody who actually committed the act because it's a hard issue. Now, these are hard sayings and teachings, even for us as we hear them, but you've got to understand what it meant to that first audience. They were like, what? First you're telling me this guy's and Pharisee is probably not even going to get into heaven, and now you're experiencing all this stuff. I've spent my life living under this system, and now you're coming and shattering all of that as if all of it was for naught and it's about heart. That's what Jesus says. Now, we know that Jesus isn't talking about every form of anger 
and he doesn't prohibit that because Jesus himself, it was his righteous anger that caused him to cleanse the temple, right? People were doing the wrong thing, and he was angry at people doing the wrong thing. So we're not talking about just being angry for being angry sick. There is a such a thing called righteous anger. In Philippians, Ephesians 5, 4.26, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. But we're talking about this selfish anger that simmers and it broods and holds a grudge, not wanting to forgive, wishing that a person wasn't even around anymore. No, I'm not planning on going out and shooting that person, but man, if somebody else did it, I'd be okay with that. Jesus is saying, listen, that's a form of murder. It's a form of murder. And then he goes on and he says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the consul. Some versions in your Bible it might say rocker if someone says that. And the idea there is, is such a derogative term of malicious abuse. It, it really just, uh, just causes, you know, arrogance in a person to look at another person and say, you know what, man, you're no good. Why are you here? Like, like you, you, you're. It's the idea of slandering a creature made in God's image. It is the idea of, you know what, like everyone talks about God don't get it wrong, but they got it wrong with you. It's, it's that thing which says, you know what, you couldn't possibly be made in God's image. It's an insult. And Jesus says, if you insult your brother, you should be liable to the council. No, the council there is stronger than the first judgment that is referring to. The judgment in uh, the first part of the verse is specific to the human court, which would normally just deal with civil normal cases. What Jesus says here in terms of being liable to the council is the Sanhedrin. That was 70 of the more uh, senior uh, elders in the Jewish tradition, and they would deal with the hard cases. The hard cases. The, we're, we're going up. It's like the Supreme Court. So Jesus says, if you want to think about people like this, if your heart is to the extent that you would rather that they weren't here, that you don't even see an inkling of my image in them because they're my creatures and you just want that, Jesus said, that's a problem. And the judgment should be on the level where the Sanhedrin has to get involved. And nobody wanted that. Like if the Supreme Court or the Sanhedrin got involved, then you got some real issues. But that's what Jesus says. And then he says, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hellfire. Progressing even more. You fool was even worse than the insults that he was just referring to. You, you fool is, again, the idea of, of, of Jesus, um, you know, or, or God. He made a mistake with you, and, and, and you are a waste of breath. You are just godless, like God got it completely wrong, but it's this heart that's even worse than the insults to the extent that, you know what, I've cut you off as a living person as if you were dead because you don't even deserve to be alive. And again, no, I'm not going to go out and get a gun and shoot you. But if this is the heart, Jesus says, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Steep. Now, it doesn't seem that Jesus is specifically talking about hell uh, this word that's used there is for uh, the Valley of Hinnom, and that was like this vast wasteland. It was always burning. It was a waste pile. It was disgusting. It was just awful, and that's where the word comes from. But whether or not he's talking about hell, it would seem that Jesus is just trying to specifically teach how awful this sin is and what you deserve, which is an ongoing hell because of the way that you have cut off or murdered somebody else in your heart. And all the time, the scribes and Pharisees would be trying to convince Jesus and everybody else of how righteous they are. And Jesus said, well, yeah, but you, you could do all of those outward things, but if you're harboring this stuff in your heart, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. To call a person a fool is the same as cursing him and murdering them in your heart. And to be guilty of that sin is to be worthy of external punishment, or eternal punishment of fiery hell. Jesus goes on in verse 23, and he says this, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. 
Now again, it's really important for us to understand that Jesus is talking to some Jewish folk with some principles that apply to us, okay? Because for us, altars and sacrifice, we know about them, but this was a daily experience for the Jewish persons at that time. A sacrifice, as understood from the Old Testament all the way through, was the thing that God put in place to ensure that the relationship between persons and God could be redeemed, set right, aligned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what it represented. What Jesus is teaching here is that, listen, even though you might have the correct sacrifice or you're bringing the right requirement and all the rest of it, but your heart isn't right, that's a problem. Because oftentimes, we would want to just come to God as if, you know what, God, I'm coming to make things right. Without appreciating the impact that our breach or our issue or the problem that we have with somebody else has in terms of that. We want to deal with God, but we don't want to deal with people. But what Jesus is saying is, in order for the worship to be correct and right with God, you got to deal with people first. You got to deal with yourself. So the picture is, um, you know, Jewish person, and it's hard to fathom this, but the sacrificial system, it was deep and it was constant, 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 constant. So a person, pigeon or lamb or, you know, there were lots of different things that they could bring. They would come to the temple. And the outer court was as far as they could go. They would meet with the priest, and they would ceremonially put their hands on the offering that they had brought. And then they would hand that offering over to the priest who would make the sacrifice on their behalf. That's just how it worked. And so what Jesus is saying, because, and again, every Jew would understand this. No Jew would have missed this. Jesus is saying, you could have raised that lamb from a little baby. It could be without spot and blemish, just like it should be. And you could be on your way to the temple to do what you know you should do. But if you're on your way and you remember that somebody has something against you and there's a breach and there's an issue, don't even hand the lamb over to the priest. There's something you got to do first. You can't just do the lamb and say, God, I'm all good when you know that there's something else going on. He said, don't even hand it over to the priest. I'm not going to accept that, right? And this is what the normal thing was because, again, from the scribes and Pharisees teaching, the only thing that mattered is that you brought the right sacrifice. Don't worry about your heart, you know? No, for us, similarly, you know, oftentimes, you know, in our setting, we'll be coming to church or not missing this or not missing that. And, and, and we might have the attitude, well, just show up and, and everything's cool. But Jesus has a different take on it, and it's much deeper and more profound. He's saying, you can't align with me while there's stuff hanging out with other people. It's just the way that it is. Settle the sin issue between you and your brother before you try to settle the sin issue between you and God. We have to understand this. This is so important because the sacrifice in the Jewish context, it wasn't just something that they did. It was a means by which they realigned with God. And if you want to realign with God, Jesus is saying, you can't just skip over people and all the baggage and all this stuff. No, it doesn't mean that every time you go and try to reconcile and all the light, everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything's going to work out. But the attitude that these scribes and Pharisees had and the way that they taught everybody else was, it don't matter. Just bring the sacrifice. Show up on time. Put your hands on it. Walk away. You're done. Jesus is saying, no. Worship don't work like that. It doesn't work like that. In Jeremiah 7, 9, we get an idea of this. Uh, Jeremiah says this, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? It's the idea. It's like, don't fake it. Like, this whole sacrificial thing, this was all about alignment based on my relationship with you. But if you haven't dealt with stuff that you need to, you can't just bypass it and say, well, the sacrifice will deal with it and all the rest of it. Mm -mm. A quote from MacArthur Commentary says this, true worship is not enhanced by better music, better prayer, better church buildings, or even better preaching. It is a matter of dealing with the heart. It's a matter of dealing with the heart. 
Jesus finishes off this section by reiterating, you know, how we got to deal with things as quickly and sincerely as possible. And he says in verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you were going with them to court. Now, it's obvious that Jesus is referring to the fact that you've done something wrong, right? In the first scenario, you may not be sure. Like, someone's got something against me. Maybe they just got it wrong. Maybe I got it wrong. Go make it right. But in this case, Jesus is being very clear. You've done something wrong, and there's someone accusing you of something, and you still want to come and worship God as if everything's cool. He says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now again, another thing that we would miss in our context. That sounds like a real simple statement, but what Jesus is saying is, listen, if there's something that needs to be dealt with, deal with it so you don't have to deal with the judgments that come by not dealing with it. In the Jewish context, they literally would be walking to the courtroom, right? So it's like, well, all right, um, we figured out that something's going wrong. My accuser is actually on the way to file papers against me. I can run up and catch him, not to just be weird about it, but to sincerely want to fix things. And we're walking almost hand in hand, and we're sorting this out before we actually get to the court so that we don't have to go through all of that and, um, you know, I made things right and all the rest of it. The thing to keep in mind is this. Once the court got involved, you had no opportunity to fix it. That's what Jesus is saying. You, you can walk, if, if one step away from the court, if you all agree, you're good. You've reconciled, your heart's right, you can worship properly, you can do all of those things. But if you get to the court and that first bit of paper is filed, it's out of your hands. You're going to deal with whatever comes with it. And you are the one who has been accused of doing something, so you need to make this thing right. Again, you have to understand this is all in the context of worship and sacrifice. And God is saying, Jesus is saying, listen, you can't just say, well, I got my sacrifice. You better go deal with that thing because sacrifice or not, the judgment is going to be on you, and God's not going to accept it anyway because your heart's not right, and you got this breach out here that you haven't dealt with. So is Jesus talking about rules, regulations, civil law? Yeah, he is. But more than that, he's talking about the heart. And he's talking about worship. That's what he's talking about. Don't come and try to fake it and say, I got my sacrifice. When you got all of this stuff hanging out there. Don't come saying, well, look how righteous I am because I never get it wrong. And in the case of the Pharisees, look at my tassels. Like, look how I dress. Look how, when I fast, I stay there looking all sad so everybody knows. Like, look at what I do. We just say, well, what you do does matter, but what your heart is like matters more. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. So as we get ready to close, I want us to look again at our bottom line which is people look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. You might remember the story in the Old Testament in Samuel where Saul had was supposed to obey God and go into war and wipe out some people and do some stuff on God's behalf because there was judgment that God wanted to bring upon these people. And uh, he does some of that, but he keep some of the spoils and all the rest of it, which was not what he was instructed to do. And Samuel confronts him as the prophet, representative of God, and he says, so, like, you got a third of it, right? But what's all of this other stuff? I'm hearing, like, sheep and this. Weren't you supposed to get rid of all this? Saul said, y you don't understand. You know, I, I, God did say that, but I had to help God out with, you know, what he was missing out. And Samuel says, well, wait a minute. Do you think God wants sacrifice? Because Saul's thing was, I kept all the sheep and stuff so that we could sacrifice more and more to God. Samuel was like, well, you think God is about the sacrifice more than the heart? He had completely missed it. And sometimes we can miss it as well. But we need to start with, you know, 
a fresh understanding of what's most important to God. Because oftentimes, what's most important to God is not what's most important to us. What's most important to us sometimes can be, again, family name, traditions, this is how we do stuff. That person hurt me. I'm not saying we should put ourselves back into dangerous situations with persons, that's not what I'm saying. But Jesus is clear as to the heart of a murderer which can reside in our hearts at times, even if we have not committed the outward act, because we have cut off a person, we have slandered them in our minds, we hate them, we wish they were dead. And Jesus says, well, that's as bad as actually committing the act because the heart is murderous. And even as we go on from here, this is the setting that needs to be understood to understand everything else that Jesus says. Jesus is saying, listen, I know you got all of these rules. I know you got your family ways. I know that you do this. I know that you do that. And I'm not saying that it's all wrong, but if you hold that level up as if automatically God's going to accept it while your heart's all messed up, then you missed it. And again, this isn't an old archaic principle because it's in the Old Testament or we shouldn't, you know, we should ignore it. It's all in the Old Testament. The whole Old Testament was about the heart. It's not just Paul talking in the New Testament. Everything that the New Testament writes and teaches is based on God's revealed law in the Old Testament. At times, we have our systems that we use to justify that our way is okay, even though it might go against what God has said. I've done it. But we need to make or ask God even for the boldness to take a, a, a new look at our hearts. Just our hearts. Is what God's looking at? Yeah, he sees what we do. He's God. But he's looking at our hearts. And what a miss it would be for God to be zeroing, zeroing in on our hearts and us zeroing on everything else. We need to zero in on the thing that God zeroes in on, which he determines is most important, and that's our hearts. Maybe you're here and anger is a huge issue. And you play over in your mind reasons why you deserve to be angry with that person. Completely get it. But Jesus is clear. He's saying, well, you got to leave space for God to be God. Don't try to be me. Deal with what happened. Do whatever you can to make things right. And it still may not work out. But that's when we leave it entirely in God's hands to do. But once we move to the space of, you know what? Everything's good. Look how righteous I am. But that person, I wish that they would die. I'm not going out there, hire a hitman. I'm not going, that would be too far. But if somehow they weren't, I would be fine with that. Jesus says, you know what? That's the same heart that give rise to murder in the person who killed somebody. Don't think that you're that different. So that's the first thing. I want us to look at our hearts. But then again, I want us to ask God for boldness to deal with what we see. It's not always easy. Got to ask for boldness. God, give me help. Maybe I haven't looked very well at my heart because I know what's there. I don't like it. And so I'd rather pretend it isn't as bad as it is. And this is for all of us. This is not a pointing finger exercise. This is Jesus cutting to the chase. He's saying, what's going on in your heart? Don't tell me about your sacrifice. Don't tell me about all of that stuff. Yes, there's a space for that. But what's going on in your heart? Just going to give us a, a minute to just pray. Just pray. Whatever God is laying in your heart, just deal with him. And then we'll pray together at the end and we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for opportunities to reflect on your word and our hearts, God. And it's in moments like this, Father, which are quiet, but oftentimes very difficult, God. 
reading your word, Father, sometimes we want to read it to hear what we already think it says, God, without really appreciating what it is that you taught. And so it's hard, God. You know everything about us, God. You know all of our relationships that we're currently in and the ones that we've had. And you, you, you know the situations that have torn us up. You know the mistakes that we've made and the ways that we've contributed to those horrible situations. But you also know, God, how other people have literally tore our hearts at times, Father. And Father, one of the immediate defenses is to guard ourselves against that person, Father, and we should, God. But Father, there is no better defense than entrusting ourselves and our stories to you. And Father, even what Jesus taught today, God, as we've reflected on this, is not easy, God. And I'm not going to pretend to know everyone's story. You do. But I do pray, Father, that your word would land on fertile soil so that the root of grace, God, would uh, just grow in lives, God. There's so many things about life that make us angry, God. So many situations in the past that have hurt us so deeply, God. But Father... You tell us in your word that if we develop a heart of murderous hate, God, even though we may not carry it out, it's as if we have, because the real issue is our hearts. And Father, I don't want to be too simplistic, God, as if there's a snap finger fix for this, God. All I can ask, Father, for myself and all of us is that you would give us the boldness to trust you, that you will not only defend us, but you will give us grace, God, to live, to reconcile where we can, God, to develop a heart that says, God, you can still deal with that person. Maybe I still need to keep myself separate from that person, God. But Father, I pray that you would help us to protect our hearts, Father, from the murderous hate that can be in it. And because we haven't committed the act, we can justify, well, I'm not like that person, or that's not really me. But God, you know all things, Father, and you look at our hearts. So Father, give us the boldness, give us the help, I pray, to trust you, God, in difficult situations, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you want to talk further about life and anger and the like, uh, we'd be happy to meet, could do it over Zoom or whatever. I just know that a lot comes out of messages like this. And this isn't a finger pointing exercise as if like I get it all right and you all get it all wrong and all the rest of it. Life hurts sometimes. It just does. And the natural defense is to protect, and I get that. This is very sobering for me. But Jesus' words are clear. We can't justify how we think or what we do based on us not doing something else. It's what's going on in the heart. So if there's any additional conversations to have, please reach out to us. I really mean that. I wish there was a space where we could do altar call and all different environment, not so good to do that per se. But recognizing that a lot comes out of messages like this. So reach out, um, and maybe even in an email I'll send out just to encourage you to do that. Um, we can do a phone call, um, Zoom, in person if that's a comfort level. Um, but we got to protect our hearts. we got to protect our hearts. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Love you all. Have a great day.